Hey everyone, this is Paul Bertarelli reporting for AvWeb. With me in the Zoom room is Randy Schlitter of Rands Aviation, who is celebrating two things this year, I guess. Uh, 50 years as a company uh, building things and 40 years uh, building airplanes. And uh, I have to say, in my experience, there aren't a lot of small airplane companies who have been around for 40 years and who have been successful at it. So we'll talk to you about that, Randy. But first, uh, talk to me about the origin of RANDs. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to um, AMP school in Wichita. And um, I decided to build a little machine that had three wheels and pedals and two seats and a sail on it. And I built that in my sister's basement in Wichita on Ellis Street. And uh, once I moved out of there, I, I started producing those vehicles, uh, parts for them. I had the day class, uh, the Votech day class machining parts for me. And I was making parts at night at my own machine shop class and going to school during the day for the uh, A&P ticket. And then from there, I moved back to Hayes and actually started the factory in earnest, in earnest to build those machines. And uh, you said you built several thousand of them. Yeah, we did. They migrated from uh, a three-wheeled vehicle with the sail and pedals to uh, ones with no pedals and just fat tires and uh, bigger sails for like what you see out on the California deserts. And we raced those and then... Uh, in competition with other in the similar what we call C-class land sailors. And then we started building recumbent bikes um, about probably somewhere between, yeah, I think the first recumbent bike was in, I'm going to say 76. And then we made those right up until about, say, seven years ago when we sold the bike company to uh, a, a very good little manufacturing firm. Are, are, any of the are any of the original trikes still out there? Oh, yeah. Uh, every once in a while we get somebody <laughs> wanting parts, which is kind of hard to provide at this point. And then, of course, in our uh, stash, so to speak, which, you know, is in what I call industrial cholesterol. There's some samples of those machines hanging out in our attics. Uh, so you got the airplane company going in 1983. Is that right? That's affirmative. Yep. And then uh, uh, what did you start with? What what uh, what pushed you into the, building your own air, airframes? Well, uh, it's a pretty simple story. I was out hang gliding and these guys were starting to mm -hmm. talk about these crazy things called ultralights. And me being the kind of smart aleck I am, I says, gee, if you really want to fly, just go get your license, you know, and, and learn to fly. And, and on the way home that evening, I'm thinking to myself, why did I say that? And it was because the contraptions they were trying to fly looked pretty, uh, pretty uh, back to the 1900s, you know, early 1900s. And I thought, well, heck, my, might as well build a uh, ultralight that looks like an airplane using all the technology that we already had in the factory. Uh, it, we, we had Dacron sewing, you know, sailcloth sewing and, and tube bending and welding and painting. Everything was there. We already were manufacturing a similar product with the uh, land sailors. So um, it was just a natural progression for us to ease into that type of manufacture. So and, we and what, the S what was that first airplane? It's the S3, which became the S4. And mm -hmm. just uh, to note, the S3 still flies. I, I lower it down from the ceiling of my hangar every once in a while and go fly it. It has a pull start 503. Still does not have brakes or doors. <laughs> it's quite the machine, though. It romps off the ground at about two and a half plane lengths. And, and uh, you that's the, you sent me a picture, and that's the gray airplane? Yeah, it's a uh, gray and yellow airplane. It started life. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that guy. Mm -hmm. There it goes. Yeah. And, and was that, um, I assume that was a kit? Yeah, we kitted it, but actually the first year, Paul, we built about 20, I had a four-man crew at the time, and we built 24 or 26 of those ready to fly in the first year. We were popping mm -hmm. out a bunch of those and, and uh, having quite the adventures of uh, learning the ropes of a small aircraft company. Yeah, well, it's it's always been challenging to, to build uh, airplanes of any size or any type, but especially small airplanes in, in limited run low volume production. 
Uh, so we, were you able to make a go of it just with that airplane or did you, were you still doing other things in the shop as far as fabrication? We were, we, yeah, we were still building land sellers and bicycles and uh, it got to the point that we had to consider cutting something. So we first cut the land sellers. We kept the bikes right up until, like I say, about six or seven years ago. Yeah, because that was a pretty, pretty slick business. The bike business was pretty easy to do once you engaged uh, other sources such as Taiwan and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, going forward through the 80s, when did the other uh, models evolve and uh, come along into into sort of what we see today or or yeah, the more sophisticated, whatever. more sophisticated kits? I should have brought our uh, chart, you know, like you see it's Cessna and Piper, their uh, family tree, but uh, in 85, we brought out the S7, and then 88, the S6, and 89, the 12, and then maybe a couple of years later, the 14, and then somewhere in there, we did the 16, and we skipped numbers because sometimes we'll do a model designation and do a design study, and then either we don't get a contract to build it, or we don't decide it's marketable. So we have some skips in our system. The S11 was a, um, we built three of those. It was a study into uh, like lifting body dynamics. And the um, S13 is a seaplane that we never got to build that we bid for some foreign country to build. And uh, 14, we did build those. And 15 is a two seat version of the pursuit of the S11, which uh, kind of still on the drawing board. Don't know if we ever go there. And then the 16 was a low wing half composite hull all metal aircraft or half uh, composite fuselage with metal wing airplane called the Shikari, nice little speedster. And then the 17 <laughs> jumps back to a tail dragger pusher. And then the 18 is a tail dragger tandem pusher. And then the 19s are low wing all metal plane. Right. And then the 20s, yeah. 20 is a, um, a tail dragger with a, um, tail dragger or trike side by side fabric plane and then the 21 so did did all of these come come about with uh, either a commission or some kind of contract or did you just build them uh, some because you wanted to build them uh it's been a mixture like uh the 12 the pusher series uh, uh a foreign country asked us to to build a copy of another uh, company's airplane i said i won't make a copy but i'll make what i think is a better airplane and so we proceeded to do so, and that, that's how the 12 came about. The Pursuit series was a study, and um, believe it or not, kind of to look at uh, super large aircraft. In fact, we were, <clears throat> just before Boeing changed, we were supposed to work with them a little bit on showing them and stuff like that on what we did there. And um, that was eventually intended to be a two-seat that we thought would be a pretty slick little bird. And let's see what else was kind of a, yeah, I've had pretty much a couple of those. I forgot the S9 and 10. Those are some aerobatic aircraft that I just personally thought would be cool. And uh, most of the planes I thought would be really cool for me haven't sold very well. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what kind of volume, uh, if you, in historical volume, how many Rand's airplanes are out there about? Oh, we're probably well past 6,000 at this point. And, uh, and what's the predominant yeah. model is, or is it one? It still was a coyote. We built probably almost 3,000 of those over mm -hmm. the years. They're all over. That got, that went big in foreign countries. It was kind of crazy how I remember the early days of trying to sell that plane in the U S it was just a uphill climb because people looked at it and they said two stroke engine, Dacron covered, who would ever want that? Well, Europe yeah. did and, and Asia yeah. did. And uh, it became a pretty staple way to design an airplane in those countries because of the quick deployment of those things. You pull that thing out of the box and two weeks later be flying it. So, Yeah, uh, having sold in Europe uh, and Asia, but especially Europe, those buyers are different. W would you deem them uh, more sophisticated or less sophisticated or something else? It's kind of both. Uh, they're happy with planes that don't go very fast, or at least they used to be because of their fields are rough and short. And then uh, their countries are small and close together. So the, the need for speed was less. So most of them were just wanting to get up and put around. 
And uh, I don't have a good bead on what's going on over there now, although we are selling 21s over there. So they've grown up. They've grown up a lot. Europe actually, I think, is kind of ahead of U.S. manufacturers in the level of fit and finish. And um, but they're also kind of behind in some ways. They're not attuned in as well to what the U.S. consumer really needs and wants. Uh, typically, where they fail most is size of their aircraft. They're they're kind of ergonomically small uh, for the bigger U.S. people. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think uh, most it. most Americans get into uh, European light sports, and first question is, where's the rest of it? it uh, yeah. They're so the, the, the cabins are so tight. It's unfortunate, but that's sort of the way it is. Now, if I'm correct, in your current line, you have uh, four aircraft. That's correct. We do the um, well. Technically, only three. We're we're doing part service on the S19, the all metal low wing, and then we do. Uh, active sales and service on the 7, 20, and 21. Yeah. Uh, is the 21 the most popular kit? Oh, yeah. That one, uh, we really, we hit a good, it's a good combination of things. It goes fast enough. It builds fast enough. It's uh, roomy enough. It's all, all the check, checks off a lot of boxes for a lot of our clients. And, and uh, the, the 21 is also available as a factory build. What's the... Uh, What's the ratio of factory builds to kits these days? My goodness, if we could build them fast enough, it'd probably be 50-50 maybe. And what yeah. is, it? Is, is it? is it? Is it predominantly kit now? Right now it is. We build a lot more kits uh, than we do ready-to-flies. Our, our ready-to-fly department's a very uh, boutique craftsman. It's not a mass production setup. And mm -hmm. uh, we build a very high quality plane at a reasonable price. And I tell you what, Paul, one of the hardest lessons in business to learn is to, uh, you know, pick a size and uh, stick with that. Because uh, when you're younger, you got you're going to rule the world and you're going to build this giant company. And then you find out that that might not be as much fun as building a sustainable company that has a quality product and and uh, good backing to the product and good service. Um, tell me how the uh, advent of LSA affected uh, the evolution of brands. It's been, a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been a positive, uh, definitely, because it's um, a little shy on what I'd say performance and weight category, which I think they're kind of working on that. But uh, it's it's been a good thing for us because our aircraft were already in that category, uh, and the twenty one is uh, in that category as well. Although we have a uh, really nice 51% uh, approved builder school that is working very well for our clients so they can have a little bit more of an airplane and uh, come out here and do their two weeks and then have an airplane. So, you, and, you also, uh, if I'm correct uh, from uh, reading the website, you have, you have a dealer network and, and do they do, can they do the builder assist program as well? No, we don't do it outside the factory. It's there's too much uh, infrastructure to support that to make that a fast and consistent. Uh, one of the secrets of success in aviation is conformity, and uh, conformity and quality control are very tight hand in hand to make reliable, safe products. And so, to police all that and to get all that up, that, that, you know, you've heard of licensing agreements by other major aircraft companies and whatnot, and if you dig into the background on those things, it's 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 very intense on information and and policing, so to speak. So no, we don't do that. Uh, you, you have been uh, at least from the outside looking in. I've never been to your uh, factory, but uh, I've seen we've corresponded and I've seen some of your uh, posts on Facebook. You are periodically investing in fairly sophisticated uh, machinery, and I'm not talking about just uh, an electric uh, uh, bending brake, but but a, but CNC machinery that uh, is very effective and productive. What have the economics uh, of that been for for a small shop like yours? Well, the ROI is always pretty quick. Uh, there's been a very cool dynamic in the CNC world. Uh, prices are 
coming down rapidly. We just installed it. Well, it isn't up and running, but we just bought a laser miter machine to miter all our tubing. And, and we paid about uh, the same price for that that we paid for our, our original miter machine, which ran a plasma torch that was built about 28 years ago that we had that custom made for us. It wasn't, nothing existed, so we had one custom built. And we've been always totally pro about getting machines that amplify each person's ability to produce product. Uh, and it's, it's been a, well, a good example was when we got that original plasma-based miter machine, uh, my welders came to me and says, well, how many of us are gonna lose our jobs? because they spent a lot of time hand mitering. And I says, well, no, look at it this way. You'll not only produce uh, more airplanes and the shop will be cleaner and nicer to work in, you also get a raise because you'll be producing more airplanes. And then of course they said, wow, when do we buy our next machine? <laughs> <laughs> and, and how have those things uh, uh, improved productivity? I, I mean, there are certain operations in, uh, rag and tube airplanes that are just incredibly labor intensive and something like uh, that, that cuts miters quickly really yeah. uh, is an order of magnitude faster, but may not. Well, how does it affect the whole? It, it basically made my crew probably almost double in productivity because the percent of time that they spend hand mitering was substantial enough that if you added it up, they could have welded a, another frame up. And mm -hmm. uh, you go from spending five minutes making a dang miter to seconds. So it's a, a 10 time, 20 fold increase in some cases. And the complexity of the miters, uh, there's no miter that challenges after that. You mm -hmm. know, and if you walk through our shop, I'll walk up to the miter machine and I'll grab a, a sample of tubing that has a company logo cut in the side of it. And that always kind of impresses people. To see mm -hmm. that you can cut that intricately, and and uh, uh, obviously the miters also resulted in a higher level of consistency in the welding between airframes. You know, because before you could tell, well, that's Joe's welding and that's Bob's, but after we got the miter machine, it was harder to distinguish who was the uh, difference in the welds. You don't do any automated welding, do you? No, late, we've looked into that. It's um. Taiwan's uh, with the bicycle manufacturing, we've had some kind of inside look at that, but it's um, it's not ready for the type of space frames we build. The, the bicycle frames are more conducive to that. And uh, everything now is, uh, is match hole drilling? Yeah, we try to do as much match hole, and uh, whether it's final and pilot, but we do back off in some areas where we do transfer drill, particularly on uh, control uh, surfaces or stabilizers and things like that, where you can induce a twist if you try to give them everything. So we kind of stay away from that. Plus it works to our advantage on uh, 51%. You know, we're bumping up against that number all the time when we do the analysis on our kids to get our 51% uh, approvals. We're real tight on that. So how many That's airplanes, Excuse how me. many airplanes are coming out of there? Uh, if you consider uh, kits and uh, factory built? Well, like I said, we don't do too many uh, factory builds. I think we do six to eight is all we can do a year versus a hundred or plus kits. You know, it's the kits are definitely faster for us to knock out the door. Yeah. So, the demand is there though to do more. Oh, I believe so. I mean, I think we're losing uh, an undetermined number due to impatient customers. Uh, Paul, one of the things I never dreamed would happen in this business is that our customers would tolerate a nine to 12 month lead time. And they are. Uh, when we started, uh, we would have born customers demanding 30 airplanes a month and they wanted them uh, within three, four weeks to be shipped, you know, and we were like always having to tell them, oh my God, it's going to be six to eight weeks. And they would cry. <laughs> uh, six to eight weeks now would mean we would have way too much production capacity and too big of a payroll to keep up with because, uh, you know, the parade stops. There's always that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that relates to what you were said, you said about uh, getting the company to the right size. Uh, exactly. 
it's, it's one thing to be slightly too small and something else to be entirely too large or slightly too large. And uh, all of a sudden you have expenses that aren't covered by uh, sales and, uh, and margin. Um, we've seen a lot of price increases in materials and especially in engines. <clears throat> How is this affecting the business? It doesn't seem to slow it down because we're all we're all riding that uh, that tied up. I mean, there's nobody out there that's not impacted by price increases all the way down to the grocery store, to the fuel pump, uh, to your home uh, expenses. It's just everybody's in this together. It's in the, it's always been going up. I mean, you know, you think back to. <laughs> You can buy a J3 for 1200 bucks, but most people only made $900 a year when you could buy a J3 for 1200 bucks. So if you really look at uh, average income and our prices, we're, we're pretty much in line with that, that ratio. So it's, it's not out of line and we're a much more sophisticated product than that uh, J, Piper J3 was back in the early forties. So we've made improvements and we've got a better product. So that's a that's a good thing that we have given you more value and more safety, more performance, more comfort, all those so things. So it sounds like it hasn't really discouraged sales much? No, not really. I think delivery time is the biggest uh, issue. And, and there's, a, there's that, you know, you're only going to live so long. A lot of our customer base is in their 60 plus range. And um but oddly enough, I got 80 and 90 year olds placing orders, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, waiting, you know, we, we hate to make them wait. We, we would like to move those guys to the front, but that wouldn't be fair to people who are already in line, obviously. But yeah, so. Um, most of your airplanes are, uh, are back country airplanes. You, you, you've branched out and you're doing some, uh, some uh, tricycle gear airplanes. Um, do you think you'll continue in that? And, and, and in general, where do you think uh, the industry is going at, at, at your that, level and, and generally for that kind of demand? That's a hard one to nail down because uh, I guess we've anticipated in a way because yes, 21 could be both. It's a great cross country aircraft. Heck, I, just the other day we left and went up the way up the top of Michigan and, and, uh, visited some folks and uh, did an airplane deal and flew two airplanes back, you know, and that was all like, you know, got up there easily in a day with plenty of time left and then turn around and head back the next morning. So versatility of a plane that does 150 plus crews is uh, you pretty much opened up the country. And if you can take that same airplane into the back country, you got a nice combination, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I think especially a 21 will be a plane that has, marketability after bush plane craze may die down now whether it actually does die down is the is the real question uh well if it, it does, if it <clears throat> if it does there could be a lot of bush planes out there <laughs> there'll be a lot of uh, bush planes available but <laughs> it, it, where it shifts to next uh, is anybody's guess my my big predictions have not come true I was predicting that the manufacturing base for these type of products would melt down. Right now, I think there's, what, 150 airplane companies of similar nature around the planet. And uh, a lot of them are sustaining their business because they're very small um, businesses that don't need a lot to keep alive. And uh, my prediction was there would be meltdown to like maybe the, the final dozen or something, but that didn't happen. And uh, the other prediction that's probably going to be somewhat accurate is, you know, you see surges like we saw the ultralight surge and then we saw the powered parachute surge. And then I think we'll see a man carrying drone surge. We're not interested in that type of flying because um, there's some definite physical limitations, but it looks fun, you know, and it looks like a product that, could become very popular and uh, and uh, widespread, and it may it may actually help our business. And a good friend of mine that worked uh, worked in the FAA said, you know, I was telling belly aching about, man, we might be pushed out of business with all these drone man carrying drones. And he says, well, they still make sailboats. <laughs> That's true. Um, do you, uh, are you interested in doing anything electric? 
We've uh, we've done a lot of study into it, spent some money looking at stuff and done some design studies and the math on it kind of sucks. <laughs> when you get in, in terms of in terms of what performance range and or yeah, or money. It, it's a it's a toss up whether you, what do you want to do with an electric aircraft and that really is what defines the type of electric aircraft. Now the Europeans are ahead of us there because they're doing probably the most possible thing with electric is building very clean high glide ratio aircraft that uh basically are you know self-launching sailplanes that yeah. i think is the most viable aspect of electric right now and then the second most viable would be man carrying drones that maybe have a 40 to 60 minute duration you go out in the pasture set up some pylons and and uh, race a course and you know maybe time it and have a competition or something yeah, but transportation wise, electric is not for long distance at this point, unless you're um, really extreme, like Solar One that, um, oh, what's his name? That famous hang glider pilot from way back flew across the country mm -hmm. and it was um, covered with solar. So, so. If as a manufacturer, um, from the manufacturer's uh, perspective, if I ask you what's missing uh, in the industry that you would like to have for building airplanes, what would it be? Well, 3D printing, that would be able to be many times faster, many times larger in size and uh, no limitations on uh, material usage. That would be the holy grail of any manufacturing right now. And I think we're headed toward that. Uh, we. We've been infiltrating 3D printed parts into our product, uh, all of which at this point are pretty much non-structural. But I do, like one day I called up a reputable 3D printing company or manufacturer of the machines and said, I need one five by five by 20. And he said, inches? I said, no feet. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, what are you going to do? And I says, well, I'll print fuselages and complete fuselage assemblies and wings. And he says, well, they won't be that accurate on that scale. And it says it won't matter. It'll be a, what we call a, um, a, a whole system to where it wouldn't matter if the parts, uh, uh, another fuselage doesn't match. It just has to match to the, uh, the wing you're printing for it. So, <laughs> but there's no material suitable that would have the weight to yeah. strength. Yeah, right. There is, but we can't afford it. I mean, there's, there's guys printing titanium and aluminum and steel, but, uh, the scale is not there and the speed and the cost, the economy is not there yet, but it'll get there. Yeah, it, it will get there. I think uh, last question. One of your competitors, uh, uh, Vans has made quite a sp splash with the RV 15. What's your impression of that airplane? I think it'll be a decent airplane. Um, I had a good conference with those guys at the uh, last year's Oshkosh and, and, and gave them my, my analysis of what they needed to change. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, we'll see. We'll see if that comes out close to those recommendations. But you know, me, me and Dick go way back, and we've had a lot of fun over the years uh, taking our digs at each other. So, do you uh, do you <laughs> predate do you predate Vans as a as a airframe uh, well, manufacturer? We, started, we actually started manufacturing products the same year, but he was ten years ahead of me on aircraft. I see. Yeah. Okay. As I met him in Ron Shetler's uh, mobile home way back when Ron Shetler was the initial importer of Rotax engines. And uh, <laughs> right off the bat, it was game on because I asked him what he did and I never heard of him. And, and he, I told him what I did. And so he says, so you build those wrinkly fabric covered aircraft. <laughs> and I says, yeah, I do. And, and uh, so you build those wrinkly metal airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a conversation worth uh, preserving. Yeah, we've had a good time over the years. We're, we're, we're friendly. He's actually bought a couple of my bikes. So, you know, he's one of my customers. I got to be nice to him, right? <laughs> yeah, right. All right, Randy Schlitter, thanks very much. I assume you will be at Oshkosh? We'll be there in force this year, celebrating our 40th. And uh, I want to compliment you on what you do for aviation. I think uh, many of us appreciate it. We appreciate the uh, 
the starkness, the honesty, the straightforwardness that you have. Uh, it's nice to have somebody that's not coding things with so much BS that uh, we have to waste our time reading that. <laughs> so I do okay, appreciate well, that. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I never like things that are sugary sweet. Yeah, All right, Randy. Go. Thanks very much. It's been a great conversation. All right. See you in a few days, bud. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.